Welcome back to our lecture series Math 3130, Modern Geometries for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Mitzeldine. At the end of lecture seven, which just as a reminder, in lecture seven, we introduced the three parallel alternatives, the elliptic parallel postulate, the Euclidean parallel postulate, and the hyperbolic parallel postulate. Uh, the most famous of all of those three is certainly Euclidean parallel postulate. And at the end of lecture seven, we define the idea of an affine geometry, which the definition is now here on the screen. An affine geometry was defined to be an incidence geometry which satisfies the Euclidean parallel postulate. So to be an incidence geometry, you satisfy the four axioms of incidence. We have line determination, which means for any pair of points, there exists a unique line determined by that pair. Um, C can't see, which guarantees that every line has at least two distinct points on it. Point existence, which says there's at least three points in the geometry. Non-collinearity, uh, which tells us that not all points lie on the same line. Again, those four axioms give us an incidence geometry. And then if we equip to the incidence uh, axioms one parallel axiom, particularly the Euclidean parallel postulate, this creates for us the idea of an affine geometry, which reminder, the Euclidean parallel postulate gives us the uniqueness of parallel lines for any line L and any P, any point P that's not on the line, there exists exactly one line parallel to L, which contains the point P right here. And so in this video, in this lecture, I should say, because there'll be more than one video, we're going to formalize the idea of affine geometry into an axiomatic system. And we're going to see that the um, affine geometry theorems that we'll do in this video and the next will generalize that of Young geometry because we've seen affine geometries before. Um, our so-called four-point geometry we introduced earlier in this lecture series is really the four-point affine geometry and Young geometry is really the nine-point uh, affine geometry and so many of the theorems we proved about four-point and Young geometry will be identical uh, and some will generalize it, of course. So the first one here, uh, we saw this when we studied uh, Young geometry here. Uh, we called it Proclus Lemma. And I gave it a name then because really this was a general theorem for all of affine geometry. Uh, and I want to make mention that affine geometry is a very important uh, study of geometry. It's, it's a very broad setting. After all, Euclidean geometry R2 is an affine geometry. Uh, clearly, there's more structure to Euclidean geometry than just the affine structure, incidence, and parallelism, but it's very important when we study Euclidean geometry, we understand its affine structure. In fact, if one goes to linear algebra, linear algebra has tons of affine uh, geometry all over the place. You use words like affine a lot when you talk about linear algebra, affine transformations, affine spans, affine combinations, because honestly, if you take any field, which of course a field, uh, for those who might not have the abstract algebra background, uh, this is a collection of numbers for which we can add, subtract, multi multiply, and divide, and those operations follow the usual rules, such as associativity, commutivity, distributive laws, we have identities, we have inverses, all that stuff. So if you have a field, um, if you take the square of a field, you can actually make an affine plane with it. And so essentially every two-dimensional vector space is an affine plane, and then higher dimensions as well are affine geometries as well. But of course, in this lecture series, we'll, we'll look only at planar geometry. And so in particular, if your field is a finite field, you can get finite affine geometries. Our four-point geometry is a result by taking the field of two elements and squaring it. Um, Young's geometry can actually be given a coordinate system by taking the field of three elements and squaring that as well. So again, just want you to be aware that this affine geometry can be found everywhere. So back to Proclus' lemma. Um, I'll restate it because there's a good chance we don't remember it when we studied Young's geometry here, but it, this is a theorem of any affine geometry. Suppose we have lines L, M, and N, and let's suppose that L is parallel to M and that M intersects N. Then we claim that L intersects N right here. And so we need to prove, we we're, gonna, we're gonna prove this one right here. That is, if these two lines are parallel and those two lines intersect, then we guarantee that these two lines intersect. 
Uh, and this is going to lead directly to our uh, transitivity parallelism, which we're going to do in just a second. So this proof is going to be identical. I want you to compare it. Maybe you have notes on this, but this is going to be identical to our proof we did for Proclus Lemma and Young Geometry. There is no part of the proof that we have to change because essentially the proof only comes from really um, Euclidean parallel posture. There is, of course, one important exception here, but uh, let, let's start the proof here. Let P be the point of intersection between M and N. So, of course, we know by assumption that M and N intersect each other. So let me draw a sketch of that. Uh, so we have our two lines, M, M, uh, M and N, excuse me, we're going to label them. We'll call this one M, we'll call this one N, and by assumption they intersect each other. So let's call that point P. Uh, we claim that this point of intersection is unique. This is a theorem of incidence geometry, but now that I've written it, I wonder, do we even need uniqueness there? We'll see it in just a moment. Well, we know that N and M are parallel to, uh, are intersect each other, excuse me. We know that L and M are parallel. That's what I, of course, was trying to say. So let's add L to our diagram right here. Let's label it L. So we know that L and M are parallel, but N and M intersect at the point P. So we need to prove that L and N intersect each other. So we're gonna do this by a proof by contradiction. Let's suppose that L is parallel to N. And so that's what we're gonna do here by way of contradiction. We're gonna assume that L uh, is parallel to N, right? Why is that a problem here? Well, notice here that we have the line L like so, and we have the point P, which we know that P is not on L. How do we know that? Well, P is on M, and L and M are parallel, so P can't be on L. So we have a line, and we have a point not on the line. By the Euclidean parallel postulate, I want you to be aware of that, then there should be a unique line parallel to L that passes through P, but we have them count them one and two. That's a violation of the Euclidean parallel postulate. So we get a contradiction there, which then means we must get the opposite of what we assumed. So we're gonna get that L is not parallel to N, which means L and N intersect each other. So this theorem follows really just from the Euclidean parallel posture. Like I said, while we do have uniqueness of intersection, we never actually needed that. It was a theorem of incidence geometry, and we mentioned it also for Young's geometry, but really it's a superfluous fact. All that matters here is the Euclidean parallel postulate. If the if the assumptions of Proclus limits were satisfied, but the conclusion was not, then we would have multiple parallel lines, which is in violation of the Euclidean parallel postulate. So this, this is a theorem for any affine geometry because it really just needs the Euclidean parallel postulate, which Young geometry satisfied, four-point geometry satisfied, and, and thus um, general affine geometry satisfies Proclus lemma. Um, in fact, I'm not going to prove this in this video. You can actually prove that in incidence geometry, Proclus lemma is logically equivalent to the Euclidean parallel postulate, although EPP is what we will assume is the axiom and we prove Proclus lemma from it. Uh, related to this is the transitivity of parallelism that I ref referenced earlier, right? Uh, this is something we explicitly proved for um, Young geometry, but the proof there is transferable immediately to affine geometry. We don't have to change the proof whatsoever because this is a generalization of Young geometry. This is a generalization of four-point geometry, just affine geometry. We have the four incidence axioms. We have Euclidean parallel postulates. That's all we need. Now, transitivity of parallelism, remember, this tells us that if two lines are parallel to the same line, they're parallel to each other. So we're trying to prove something like the following. If L is parallel to M and if let's say L is parallel to N, then we have that M is parallel to N. Now, to write transitivity, we typically have to write this a little bit differently. We might say something like this. Let's swap these elements right there. So we'd say that M is parallel to L, and then L is parallel to N, then M is parallel to N. That's how transitivity of a relation is typically written. Now, because parallelism is a symmetric relationship always. You can swap the order of that, no big deal. And also by construction, parallelism is a reflexive uh, relation. So if a parallelism is a, is if it's a 
equivalence relation depends entirely on whether it's transitive. And it turns out it'll be transitive only in affine geometry. Transitivity of parallelism is also something logically equivalent to the Euclidean parallel postulate inside of incidence geometry. We will prove it as a consequence of Proclus' lemma. Now, how do we do that? Well, let's take the assumptions here. Let's assume that M and N are both parallel to the line L, like we have assumed right here. And then let's, let's suppose the contradiction there, proof by contradiction, we'll say not M parallel to N. So let's say they intersect each other. So let's draw our picture. Well, our picture is gonna look exactly like we saw a moment ago. Since M and N intersect each other, they would cross like that. L is parallel to both of them, like so. And so what's happening here? We have our M, we have our N, we have our L. We see that um, because L and M are parallel and because M and N intersect each other, then Proclus Lemma applies, which with our numbering system, that was 1, 4, 18. That then gives us that L and M must intersect, which then contradicts the assumption here. So the, if, if we didn't have transitivity of parallelism, we would contradict Proclus Lemma, which is already been established. So therefore, M and M have to be parallel to each other. That's an important consequence here. So look at these theorems here, the Proclus limit, transitivity parallelism. These are the exact same proofs we used with Young's uh, geometry because it was really a theorem affine geometry. We didn't have to change the proof whatsoever. Now in some situations, we there, well, basically this, everything that's true about affine geometry must be true for Young's geometry. Um, it must be true for four-point geometry because those are affine geometries. But there are some theorems that'll be more uh, will be more specific to those geometries. Like for example, Young's geometry only has nine points. Every point, every line in Young's geometry has three points. Now that theorem won't be true for every affine geometry because in four-point geometry, lines only had two points. But what we can do is generalize those theorems to any affine geometry. So like we observed, four-point geometry, every line had two points. For Young geometry, every line had three points. In general affine geometry, we can generalize that principle to the following. All lines contain the same number of points, which of course in four-point geometry, that number was always two. In young geometry, that number was always three. This happens in general. And this is actually a very beautiful proof, one of the most important proofs I'd say for affine geometry, that all lines contain the same number of points. All right, so what we're gonna do to prove this is we have to take two arbitrary lines. Uh, so we're going to take two lines, L and M. And what we're going to then do is then prove, since these two lines were chosen arbitrarily, we're going to prove that these lines have the exact same number of points. We can do that by establishing a bijection between the points on L with the points on M. A bijection is going to be a one-to-one -one onto map, an injective and surjective map. This will establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between the points of L and M, which then will say that the set of points on L compared to the set of points on M is the same number. This will even apply if we have an infinite number of points. So if one line has a countable many, if a line has countably many points, then the other line has to also have un, uh, have countably many. And one line has uncountable many points, then the other one also has to be uncountable. This even applies to infinite sets as well. So how are we going to do this? Well, we have to take a starter point. So the line L has some point on it. We're going to call that point P. It doesn't matter which point you choose, but by secancy, we know it has at least one point. Um, likewise, there has to be a point on M, and I, I, I should also mention that this point P is not on M, okay? Because it could be possible that it could be possible that L and M actually intersect each other. We don't claim that they're parallel lines, right? It could be they intersect each other, but intersections in incidence geometry are unique. So there's only one point of intersection between the two lines, if there's even one. Maybe they are parallel lines. But by secancy, there's a second point, then that second point can't be on both lines. So we do know we have a point on L that's not on M. Um, and likewise, there has to be a point Q 
on M that's not on P by the same reasoning. So we have a point on one line, but not the other, and on one line, not the other. So we have these two points, P and Q. So, so far, of course, how we've done this, we've used um, we've used C, K, and C to get two points on line. We've used line determination to guarantee that the intersection of lines is unique. We're going to use line determination again because we're going to form the line that connects P and Q. Now let me draw that again. Connect the lines P and Q. We're going to call this line little n. Like so. It's the line uniquely determined by P and Q. Then for each point on L, and I'm gonna write this as an X right at the moment, because I want you to think of this as a variable, right? Because for every point on L, it's called X, and we don't know how many points there could be on L here. Like in four-point geometry, there's only two points. In Young, there's three. But in Euclidean geometry, we're gonna have uncountably many points. These are all, aff these are all affine geometries, don't, doesn't matter. Just take consider any other point on L. By the Euclidean parallel postulate, there exists a unique line that's parallel to n that passes through x. And so consider that line for a moment here. The unique parallel line that contains x that is parallel to n. Let me make it look a little bit more parallel, at least parallel in the Euclidean sense. So we get something like that. We're going to call this line n sub x. This is a line parallel to n but passes through the point x. All right, such a such a line is guaranteed as by the Euclidean parallel postulate. It's the only one there is, and I should mention that it will the line n x will intersect L, but that intersection will be unique, and so the only point that's shared between n x and L is going to be this point x. Okay, so now when you look at this over here, my diagram seems to suggest that the line NX should intersect M. But how do we know that? The thing is, we're not drawing a picture of Euclidean geometry, although my diagram looks Euclidean at the moment. How do I know this intersection actually exists? Because when we draw four-point geometry, after all, we draw it like this, and we have four points, one, two, three, four. And while there's an intersection of the in the diagram, that intersection actually has no point there. How do we not know we have a similar thing going on here? It's just it's an it's a you know misinformation from the diagram or something like that. Well, we have to have an argument here. There is in fact a point of intersection here, and this follows by Proclus lemma. Because notice what we have here. Whoops, we have that the lines in X and N are parallel to each other. We have that N and L intersect each other. Uh, excuse me, that's not the one we want to do. Uh, we have that N and M intersect each other. Um, the direction I was going would show that L and NX intersect. We already know that. But let's see. NX and N are parallel, but N and M intersect. Then by Proclus' lemma, we have to then have that NX intersects M somewhere. We are going to call that point Y sub X, like so. So there's some, there's some point of intersection, and again, as intersections are unique, um, there's only one point on NX and on M, and so we can, in an, un, an unambiguous manner, identify this point as YX. And notice we've, we gave it the subscript Y sub X, and the reason we're doing that is we're connecting a point on L to this point y sub x right there so there's an identification going on in all reality this is going to be a function relationship so we've established a function from the points on l to the points on m and it follows the rule that x is going to map to y sub x by this construction i'll note of course that if you take f of p this is identified with the point q um, because there's a unique line parallel to n that passes through p and that's n itself because then it's considered parallel to itself. So um, just so you're aware, P Q is the point Y sub P. Uh, we'll just continue to call it Q right here. So we have this identification. And I want you to be aware this is a well-defined map because given any point here, there's only one point on M it's going to be identified to. Um, and likewise, it's also going to be a one-to-one -one map. If you take um, any two points over here, there's only one X, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say, if you take different Y coordinates, you're going to have two different lines parallel to N associated to it. And so this gives you two different X coordinates. It's going to be a one-to-one -one map. Um, it's also onto, how do I know it's onto? Well, 
uh, we can kind of work the other way around, right? If we take a lot, if we take the line n and we take any point on m, then by the by EPP, there's a line parallel to n that contains that point. By Proclus lemma, that point will intersect here somewhere on L, and then that point will map to the starter point. So this map is, in fact, bijective. You can also um, construct the inverse of this map by working backwards. Notice we started with points on X. Um, we could have started points on M. Excuse me, we started points X on L. We could have started with points on M and worked backwards. It has an inverse. That also proves it's a bijection. So that's the important thing here. This map, F, is in fact a bijection. It's one-to-one -one and onto, which means that the cardinality of the domain is equal to the cardinality of the codomain. For which, what do I mean by the cardinality of a line here? I'm talking about the points on the line. And so this establishes that the number of points on L is equal to the number of points on M. It's a nice, cute little argument, but this is one of the most fundamental arguments for affine geometry. All lines have the exact same number of points. Young's geometry had three points per line. Four-point geometry had two points per line. Um, and we're going to see in the next video what are the consequences of this very important observation.